Uh, for yesterday, uh, what we did was uh, that we talked about the post traumatic stress and uh, we also discussed about the argument uh, you know that whether it should be designated as a disorder or not. And then we uh, finally came to a point where uh, we uh, did touch upon the issue that uh, only a selective uh, percentage of the people who suffer extreme adversity in life, they only develop post traumatic stress. And this had you know led to another uh, construct uh, what is called as post traumatic growth. We saw the definition, uh, we also saw the spheres in which the changes are uh, prominently visible. Today we are going to talk about uh, two of the theoretical models uh, that tries to describe how a person grows uh, in the aftermath of a traumatic experience. Now this is the functional descriptive model given by uh, Trotsky and Cohen. What they say is uh, that you have a pre-trauma state. Okay, so don't uh, uh, no note down this uh, structure. No, I'll uh, mail it to you. So there is no point noting it down. So you have a pre-trauma state. That is, no when the actual uh, catastrophic event took place, the period before that, and then you have something called seismic event. Uh, what uh, Trotsky and Cohen did was that they said that uh, the traumatic experience of life can be compared to a severe seismic event, okay, a major earthquake, where uh, the alignment of a whole lot of thing changes. Okay. So, they said that actually what happens that a seismic event comes and then it challenges you at three different fronts. One, it challenges you to manage your emotional distress. So, the overall the outcome of uh, the traumatic experience would be extreme uh, distress which you will have to manage. One, two, there might be uh, no uh, extreme challenges uh, that basically questions your schemas, your belief and your goal. Schema is like say you have understood that this is what world is, this is what a particular relationship is. Okay. So, that the whole fabric gets challenged, you have to reinterpret them. Your belief changes, okay. uh, usually we all have a tendency of uh, know, somehow expecting that these things happen, but it cannot happen to me. Okay. So, when it really happens to you, then uh, your belief gets shaken and the goal that you have set for yourself, your intermediate goals, maybe your ultimate goal, okay, that gets challenged. And third, the way you have been narrating your life experiences, that also suffers a major challenge. Okay. Now, the challenges at all these fronts would primarily mean okay, that you have to struggle a whole lot okay, in terms of overcoming the distress, managing the distress in terms of redefining uh, your life narratives, in terms of uh, you know, reinterpreting your own belief, goals and schemas. Okay. Now, the challenge that we see uh, at all these spheres, okay, they finally make you ruminate. Okay. Now, uh, in psychology we talk about two different processes, opposite, uh, opposite processes, rumination and reflection you know the distinction between the two. No. See rumination is where, uh, see uh, first you know before coming to rumination just uh, know think of the usual life experiences. No. If you are told to recollect your own experiences okay, of whatsoever had happened to you, you would have uh, know a whole range of experience. So, part of the experience which would be very, very positive, which will make you very happy when you uh, uh, reflect, uh, when you look back on that, uh, part of the experience which will make you very sad and so forth. 
because the experiences would always be basically a mixed bag. Therefore, there are people who at times when they have to recollect their past experiences, they choose only negatively charged experiences. You know I had a friend who behaved very badly with me, even uh, my father once did so, there was a stranger travelling with me, he also did so. So, what you do? These are discrete phenomena, no? something happened at 6 years of age, something happened at 12 years of age, something happened at 26 years of age, but then you know selectively pick and choose and weave them together. Okay. Such type of uh, recollection of your experience is remunerative. Okay. The opposite process could be reflective in nature, reflective process would mean uh, that you again look back at your past experiences and uh, you say you know uh, life for everybody would always be a mixed bag. I also had some uh, adverse experiences, but uh, now when I uh, look back I think for many of those things I myself was responsible. Okay, if I would not have done this then this would not have happened. Uh, that person I did not do anything, but uh, he did something bad, but you know human beings are like this. Okay. So, the ultimate thought that you finally gain in the process of recollection is not negatively charged, usually it is either positively charged or what you do is that you remove the valency, the negative positive charge of that experience you remove and therefore, overall in the reflective mode you say that okay, I think I did something wrong, I do not know, probably I have understood it uh, much better now. So, overall if you think okay, reflective thoughts would be positively charged that way. Okay, so, that is the difference between remunerative and uh, remuneration and reflection and in this case uh, according to the Tradiskis and Cohen's model, okay, once you are uh, uh, no certain things in your life are challenged, you start ruminating. So, all negativities will come back to you and mostly they are automatic and intrusive in nature. Okay. So, you do not try to recollect your experiences of the past, but it starts pouring in that is the intrusive thought. Okay. Now, when this happens two simultaneous processes will take place. <coughs> One there could be a process of self disclosure, self disclosure in the form of uh, writing. So, you start making a note of uh, your ex adverse, adverse experience, you start talking to others what actually happened to me, study we took an example of uh, uh, somebody who was serving at uh, Shamiana restaurant when 26 11 took place, you talk about your experience okay. or you uh, know participate in praying. Okay. So, these are uh, know the methods of self disclosure, basically what you do is that you have all those ruminative thoughts and you start sharing, two forms of sharing are verbal sharing, no? when you talk to others it is a verbal sharing. In the case of prayer also you talk to God, it is a verbal sharing. In the case of writing you uh, note down your, you pen down your experience. Okay. Then what happens? This rumination undergoes reduction of emotional distress. Okay. It also leads to uh, know, management of automatic rumination and disengagement from goals. So, because you have been involved in certain type of disclosure, so finally, you realize that you are able to see somewhat decline in the emotional distress which you initially experienced know, when the seismic event had taken place. Okay. So, this by default means that self disclosure as a module helps an individual minimize the level of emotional distress. Know. Now, this automatic rumination that was taking place. Okay, where the all those intrusive thoughts were coming, okay, you think that you are now able to manage them, okay. but still you find that you are still disengaged from your goal, you do not find uh, know, 
the earlier goals that you had set for yourself you do not find still it a very charming and therefore, you do not uh, move ahead that way. Then gradually you come to a state where you have more deliberate rumination. Deliberate rumination would mean that you make an effort to recollect those experiences. Okay, now it is no more automatic. Okay. Your schema undergoes changes. So, the way you were interpreting uh, life, the way you were interpreting the worldly phenomena, now you have a fresh definition of it. Okay. And then certain new forms of narratives will develop, the way you used to explain your life experiences that will certainly undergo a big change. Okay. Now, uh, at these two steps when you have the reduction of the emotional stress and when you have uh, you know, more deliberate rumination, okay. social support plays an important role. Okay. So, you have uh, you know, models for schemas, coping and post traumatic growth means you look at uh, you know, those models who also had similar experiences okay. and it helps you, you know, regain yourself, realign yourself and think that if he can, if she can then why cannot I. Okay. There would be you no know, other other forms of uh, social support mechanism okay. and social support mechanism further in uh, you know, facilitates the reduction of the emotional distress, uh, makes the rumination process more deliberate rather making it more and more. Uh, automatic. Okay. It also you know, um, finally, helps you uh, what you call reshape your own uh, representation of the world, the uh, life experiences and therefore, it plays an, an important role there. Now, after all these changes have taken place, when you realize that uh, you, know, you have uh, change in your schema, when your life narrative changes, the stage that you attain is the stage of post traumatic growth. Okay. This post traumatic growth in turn makes you more wise okay. and your wisdom in turn you know, constantly feed, uh, gives a feedback to your post traumatic growth. Simultaneously, these challenges that you had experienced long back. Okay, it keeps on coming as enduring distress okay, and it hits you. Okay. So, this primarily would mean that even though you have evolved as a much better human being, okay, the catastrophic experience that you had you do not forget it. Okay. That distress will at times haunt you. Okay. The only good thing is that because now wisdom also keeps on giving feedback to you. Therefore, once your earlier traumatic experience flashes back, okay, your wisdom also tells you that yes, I know that, I still remember that, but you know it keeps happening. It has happened to 1,004,096 people in this world till now. Okay. So, this is how this uh, model tries to describe how post traumatic growth takes place. But I must tell you that this is again a theoretical model. Okay. Then comes the other model what is called as uh, the organismic valuing theory. Uh, those of you who have uh, gone through PSY 151 course okay, must be aware of this. Uh, there was a what you call a, there is a school of thought in psychology uh, called the humanistic and existential psychology. Humanistic and existential psychology uh, basically professes uh, the importance of the person. Okay. So, you as an individual is always given utmost priority compared to rest all psychological processes that are uh, taken care of while defining your psyche. Okay. Organismic valuing theory you know, uh, runs on the broader framework. Uh, that has been given by the humanistic and existential thought in psychology. What this theory proposes is that you have a normal uh, baseline level, then you experience the trauma okay. and when you experience the trauma two possibilities are there. Okay. Either you assimilate the experience or you accommodate the experience. 
okay. If you accommodate the experience then again it could either be a positive accommodation or it could be a negative accommodation. Okay. Now, assimilation and accommodation would be like say you have a thread like this okay, and you take a crystal or say you take another thread okay, and put it near the original thread that is running continuously. Okay. So, if it is just as an extra addition that is what is called as assimilation. Okay. Accommodation would be where the running thread okay, accommodates it leaves a space, so that the new thread can be put inside and it could be you know, woven along with the original thread that is continuously running. So, accommodation and assimilation of experience is like this. Okay. So, you when you have your continued life experience with an additional attachment that is the process of assimilation. If you are able to assimilate your experience okay, according to the organismic valuing theory, you are finally able to regain your pre trauma baseline. So, the state where you were before this seismic event okay, you would invest some time in uh, trying to assimilate your experience. Once you have assimilated it, you will go back to your pre trauma baseline, you are able to uh, run your life the way you were doing that. If you are going to accommodate your experience, okay, means if you are going to realign your past experiences, so that the new experience can be fitted into it, okay, then there are two possibilities, either you positively accommodate it or you negatively accommodate it. If you negatively try to accommodate your experience, then according to this model it leads to psychopathology. Psychopathology in this case would mean post traumatic stress disorder. Okay. And if you are going to positively accommodate it, okay, then you attain what is called as post traumatic growth. Fine. Again this is a theoretical model, okay. uh, but because this model was proposed as initially as part of a doctoral thesis, uh, therefore uh, some amount of uh, you know, uh, empirical data is involved in terms of proposing the model. Okay. The only difficulty as of now is that there is not a very prescribed route okay, that positive accommodation means if it is done this, 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 this way then it is positive. Okay, and in case instead of taking a left turn, if you take a right turn from here, it leads you to another direction where it is negative accommodation. That uh, no whole sequence of event, the way it was uh, prescribed in the earlier model, okay, this model that still you do not find in the case of organismic valuing theory. Couple of years back, I think three four years back, uh, one of my PhD student had done a work on. Uh, post traumatic stress and growth in the Buddhist community, okay, which is staying here in Dharamshala. And basically it was the monks and the nuns. Okay. I do not exactly remember the number, the sample size I do not remember, uh, but it was a good, num a good number, I guess perhaps 200 plus number of uh, monks and nuns. And uh, primarily their uh, what you call as the primary inducers of stress were identified okay. and then uh, you know different different things were taken into account. But finally, we had taken ruminative thoughts means rumination, reflection, we had taken uh, cognitive emotional processing, how do you process your own emotions, how do you regu uh, to what extent you are able to regulate your own emotion and then finally, uh, you know, trying to find out that uh, what actually leads to what. So, if you put it in a regression model, it will tell you, you know that these are primarily uh, the denominators of this problem or these things lead to this. I must tell you that uh, based on that empirical data, we uh, did find you know the importance of uh, uh, remunerative process, reflective process, cognitive emotion regulation. Of course, in Tedeschi's model there is no description of cognitive emotion regulation, he talks about 
the distress factor emotional distress and the intrusive nature of it the automated nature of it and then reduction in the nature of uh, emotional distress and finally making the rumination more and more deliberate from the automatic end. Uh, so, partly uh, what we empirically found out from uh, the Buddhist community here in India was endorsing uh, this model at the same time okay, assimilation of course, we did not check, but what was very interesting to observe was post traumatic stress and growth it might appear you know, that uh, either you develop a pathology or you develop a um, uh, growth pattern out of your traumatic experience means either or, but in reality either or situation does not exist. Okay. So, there could be a possibility that you are still under distress extreme emotional distress, but still you are evolving. Okay. And for certain duration the stress and the growth can run parallel after a particular limit then you realize, realize that the growth okay, starts surmounting the stress okay, and this is how you are able to manage it. Okay. So, that was all about uh, stress and growth. There is another thing uh, that we could have talked about but we would deliberately not uh, know go uh, into the details of it uh, what is called as acute stress disorder. Okay. Uh, the type of stress we were uh, know talking about here was primarily a simple or a complex type of stress which leads to certain uh, changes in the psychological behavioral and the physical spheres, okay. but we did not go into the that domain of stress which is clinically considered to be disorder. Okay. Uh, deliberately I thought initially we will do it, but uh, then I thought that uh, there is no point talking about stress as a disorder. Okay. So, we have deliberately no I have removed it from here. So, we would talk about the acute stress disorder. Fine. Now, we would took talk of uh, no two positively oriented uh, no constructs in psychology resilience and copying. This is a definition given by uh, Langer he says that resilience actually is the ability to restore balance following a difficult experience and integrate it into the backup of one's total life experiences. Okay. So, primarily this is your ability to bounce back okay, once you start sliding down. Okay. So, you have a difficult experience, but resilience gives you that strength to restore your balance, okay. but interesting thing also is that it finally gets integrated into your total life experience. This primarily would mean that uh, there are different words also I must tell you, you know that uh, nowadays uh, in uh, scientific terminology we uh, do subscribe to only one term called resilience, but you would find uh, many synonymous words being used in the literature earlier you know, uh, like hardiness was one construct okay, which actually defined resilience. So, altogether if you make a literature survey six seven different types of words were being used okay, to describe this phenomena, okay. but gradually now people have come to an agreement that all these words synonymous words actually represents resilience nothing else. Now, what happens it is basically you know uh, it reflects the perseverance of an individual okay, to certain affective cognitive and behavioral uh, no, uh, situations. No. So, you are able to optimally utilize your internal and your external resources, okay, so that you can positively cope with the situation given the socio-economic constraint that you have. Okay. So, whatever environmental constraints you have, okay, you try to optimally utilize your internal and the external resources, but then 
you would certainly know the important thing in resilience is that you have that ability of perseveration. So, if you know that this is how it will be done, you do it once, two, twice, thrice, ten times, twenty times, and finally it happens. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you have read this story. There is a popular story usually uh, prescribed sometime in the primary uh, classes days, no, in Hindi text. Long back, I had uh, read it. No, that uh, there was. Uh, a mother with a small baby, uh, the mother always used to go to the well to fetch some water okay. and she used to have that earthen pot around which she would uh, coil a rope okay. uh, and that uh, using a pulley the rope will uh, go into the well and this is how she would uh, fetch water. And uh, beautifully this story continues, the end of the story has two important things. One, uh, that the rope happens to know every day uh, crisscross a uh, stone surface. Okay. So, it was a wooden pulley, but then there was a stone and the rope always used to move on the stone and although stones are capable you know if you rub uh, rope against stone finally, the rope will get cut. Okay. But in this story at the end you realize that the rope has a mark, okay. mark because the rope always used to move on that stone. So, the stone had that deep mark one and two that the mother used to keep the earthen pot again on a platform made of uh, stone. Although it was earthen pot, but because it was kept so many times okay, that the you know, stone itself had you know, uh, developed a particular shape there. Basically, this story was trying to say that it is not that how strong you are or how weak you are, okay, but actually how perseverant you are. Okay. So, even rope if it keeps moving on the stone repeatedly, it will leave a mark on the stone. If the earthen pot is put repeatedly on the stone, it will leave a mark permanently there. Okay. So, perseverance when we talk about uh, with respect to resilience is equivalent to the phenomena that was described in this story. It could be an effective perseverance. No? Uh, imagine situation where people are passionate about a cause, they fight for a cause and they themselves suffer in this whole process. Okay. And you would realize that these are the people uh, whose passion does not die okay, because of their adverse experiences. So, the experiences might be extremely adverse, but they would not lose their passion for whatever they are doing. And there could be you no know, both the positive and the negative interpretation based on from which side you are looking at the phenomena. Okay. But then people who are actually indulged in that process okay, and are convinced that they are doing it for a greater cause, you would realize that uh, their affective component uh, becomes more and more stable in that process. So, is their cognitive process, their whole thought, you no, know, they have well thought the things before they have entered into this periphery and now they are you know well determined that if not during my lifetime during uh, the lifetime of my second generation third generation but one day this change will come okay look at all uh, you know the all those who were involved in the, the freedom movement for example Many, many, many of them died. No, they didn't know what will happen next. But they were convinced, in terms of their uh, thought processes, that it has begun. It will take time. But if not during my lifetime, maybe my next generation. And if by not even by their time, then by the time the third generation comes into being, one day the target will be achieved. Okay. That is perseverance in their thought process. Similarly.
because you yourself are confident to believe that yes, I can certainly do this. And once you have these external resources pouring in, your inner strength further consolidates. This uh, no mixture of the internal and external resources is uh, available. Certainly gives you more force the goal. The only thing uh, in the case of resilience is uh, you would realize that uh, people, I'm repeating this, I told you two, three days back also this example, that people who fight for much bigger causes, they are they have been found out to be much more resilient compared to people who are not engaged in such things. I'm not advocating that everybody should fight for bigger cause. Okay. Uh, this is what has been empirically found. And now we come to the last topic that has to do with this module, uh, where we would be talking about coping. Okay. Uh, coping, as you, uh, you know, must have uh, realized by this time, is basically that process which describes the phenomena of overcoming the, all the problems that one has experienced okay, and trying to uh, either live with it, developing capability of managing it okay, and further moving ahead in life. You remember we had talked about uh, appraisal of different different emotions. No? So we take uh, the definition of coping given by Lazarus and Folkman and uh, they say that Coping refers to constantly changing cognitive, behavioral and emotional efforts to manage particular external and or internal demands that are appraised as taxing or exceeding the resources of the person. So if you realize uh, that the situation that you are experiencing, it is too taxing for you, okay, or it finally is, uh, you know, cuts on the resources that are available to you and therefore you realize that your resources are getting depleted. Okay. In such situations, okay, coping basically you know, uh, helps you manage the constantly changing uh, situations at the cognitive, behavioral and at the emotional level. Okay. And it helps you, uh, you know, manage your external or internal demands. So, uh, it's, it would say like if you take the example of a uh, seesaw, okay, your demand would suddenly know we will be overpowering in the beginning and then coping comes into picture and it helps you strike that balance. So it refers to the cognitive way of managing the intake of emotionally arousing information. No? The moment you realize that your resources are being depleted, it's a great sense of discomfort to you. Okay. And the discomfort that you uh, experience, okay, will uh, no, finally lead to certain degree of emotional arousal, and therefore coping provides you a cognitive mechanism of managing those emotions. In terms of explaining how many types of coping do we have, okay, uh, it's very difficult, uh, no, so say. If you make the list, uh, it will be a much longer list. If you uh, look at the overall <laughs> development in this area, primarily, if you take uh, you know, different types of coping and put them in terms of approaches that has been uh, taken, okay, you can do it twofold. One, uh, what is called as problem-focused and emotion-focused coping approach. This is uh, you know, the initial proposal that was. Uh, given by Lazarus and Folkman. Okay, and little later when people started talking about cognitive coping, and nowadays people also talk about something called proactive coping. So, what is problem-focused coping? Problem-focused coping includes effort which talks about direct control and change of the sources of psychological burdens, such as learning new skills, removing barriers generating alternative, alternative solutions. So basically, the coping is looking ahead with the situation in terms of uh, a whole set of problem. You break it into pieces okay, and for each of the subset of the problem, you formulate a new solution. 
and because you are now able to manage it, okay, because it says no that uh, you go in terms of say learning new skills. Now, if you learn a new skill, this basically means that you had a problem and you realize that you are not capable of handling it with the given type of resources that are available to you, unless you learn a new skill, and therefore you learn the new skill. Okay. Now, because you have learned a new thing, therefore you are able to handle the situation. It could be uh, you know, as small as a situation like say, uh, going to the pre-primary uh, schools. Okay. A child who visits the school for the first time and finds it extremely difficult even to stay for two hours in the school. Okay. From that point, when you finally come to a level where two hours of non-stop lecture and you can still uh, listen to it. Okay, three hours of lab session and you can still uh, you know, participate there. Okay. So that's like developing new skill. The nature of the problem keeps on changing. The demand that is put forth in front of you, that also you know, gets magnified gradually. But along with the magnification of uh, you know, the problem, okay, you also keep on keep on adding new skills to yourself and therefore you are able to cope with it. That's problem focused coping. Emotion focused coping basically refers to managing the emotional responses to the stressor, such as wishful thinking, seeking emotional support, or social comparisons. No? Now, wishful thinking uh, is a, an interesting construct in psychology. We won't go into the details of it, but you would find you know very interesting type of uh, descriptions. Even uh, some amount of uh, empirical research has also taken place. Uh, with respect to wishful thinking. It's more like say, if this would have happened that, then that would not have happened. Okay. There is another word in psychology used for this, what is called as counterfactual thinking. Counterfactual thinking is, something has happened, you reflect back and you say that this would not have happened if that would not have happened. Okay. If I would have done things like this, okay, then it would have been like that. Okay. So that's counterfactual thought. Okay. And again, uh, in, even in counterfactual thoughts, you have you no know, positive and negative counterfactual thoughts. Okay. In one case, you would say that things would have been better if it would have been done that way. Okay. And in the other case, you say, oh, thankfully only this happened, it could have been even worse. Say for example, you are traveling in a boat, okay, and the boat capsizes. Okay. There was extreme sense of panic that you experienced, but finally you were able to sail and come to the banks. That's the time when you realize that, oh, I could have even died. Thank God. Okay. Means you think of the worst and therefore you are happy you are in it. Oh, it could have been even worst. I came only up to this point. Thank God. Okay. That's the positive way in counterfactual thought. Okay. And the negative, of course, you can think. No, that uh, if the boatman would not have done this, then this would not have happened. If I would not have taken this boat, then that would not have happened. Things like this. Okay, seeking support from others. Okay, where uh, others provide emotional support to you, and <coughs> utilizing social comparisons. This has also been uh, considered uh, to facilitate your emotion focused coping. Folkman and Lazarus proposes that uh, uh, the entire coping can be bifurcated in terms of these two approaches: that you have problem focused coping, you have emotion focused coping. Now we have a uh, no, whole lot of uh, coping strategies that has been advocated. Uh, in fact, uh, now when we would have our uh, self-evaluation sessions, okay, there I will also uh, no, ask you to participate in a um, questionnaire type of a thing where you would have seven different types of coping strategies. Okay. The prominent coping strategy that now people talk about is cognitive coping which involves a conscious mental process of handling negative life events. 
reappraisal, refocus on planning, okay, are some of the components of the coping strategy. So what you do is uh, that you have looked at things from one way, you revisit it. So you go for a reappraisal, okay, or you plan something, refocus on your plan, execute it halfway, you again evaluate your plan. Okay, so. There is an argument that uh, you know, if you adopt strategies like this, okay, uh, this also facilitates your coping, but this is more of a cognitive process that is involved in the coping mechanism and therefore it is called as cognitive coping. And last and very interesting coping strategy, uh, what is called as proactive coping. It is basically you know, a combination of autonomous goal setting with self-regulatory goal attainment and it emphasizes on recognition of cues to reduce, modify stress. So basically what it says is, uh, it, because it is proactive, therefore you have to uh, know, anticipate some forthcoming event and there is of course a preparedness for it. So you show certain degree of anticipatory preparedness for the forthcoming event. Okay. And that is uh, no, proactive coping. So basically, what it means is that there are certain uh, type of uh, no, life events that has probably certain degree of predictability. Okay. Say three days of Tekrati for example, and I know that I would not get the chance to uh, read during this time because I would be engaged in X, Y, Z type of activities for these three days. Okay. And then there is a quiz announced on the next Monday. Okay. So you will have to you know somewhere make an anticipation that in case the quiz is held on Monday, then how do I distribute my time? Okay. How do I uh, plan the whole thing so that okay, I do not compromise neither in terms of participating in technology nor in terms of getting a good score. That is cognitive coping. No? You have a uh, plan at hand, you revisit your plan, halfway you refocus on your plan. That's uh, <coughs> cognitive coping. But imagine situations uh, where it's the situation that you are contemplating is not going to come in the immediate future, but it might come in the long way. Okay. For example, somebody tells you that you know uh, when you speak, you use too many words. Uh, but all your words make very little meaning. Okay. And you know that uh, by the time you will come to a certain level in your BTEC program, okay, you will have to face uh, different companies during the SPO activities. Okay. And be because I know of this, that one day this will come, therefore I start preparing myself well in advance. I develop softer skills in me, I refine the softer skills in me, okay. Now this type of uh, no, uh, coping is primarily proactive coping, you know, where there is an anticipatory preparedness that this might happen, one day this situation might come and hence I plan for it before it. Okay. So that was all, that was all about coping. During this module, what we have discussed is right from stress to burnout to post-traumatic stress, post-traumatic growth, resilience and coping. So whole uh, lot many things we have discussed. Uh, usually, traditionally, if you uh, look at uh, how these things are taught to the university students, so usually this would be broken into pieces. No? So coping would be an independent topic, resilience would be an independent topic, stress would be independent, post-traumatic stress would be independent. You know? But because we have uh, you know, one semester and we have to zip in everything together, therefore all this was put together. So it was all about this module. Next when we meet, we would be starting a new module where our focus would be on progression. Okay. And once we complete that, then we will be moving to psychological results.